Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending uh, the top 10 features of an association LMS webinar this morning, uh, put on by Talented Learning and WBT Systems uh, teaming up. Uh, we appreciate you taking the, uh, an hour out of your busy day here to, to come in and learn about this. Something we've been working on uh, for quite a while uh, at Talented Learning is, is working on defining the association space. And we're going to share a lot of that uh, research and, and perspective with you today and then uh, uh, bring in Mike uh, Barroso here to uh, help us put a, a real life uh, a real life spin on on what's going on in, in inside the association space and how that's different than uh, the employee uh, learning management space and so uh, let's let's get right into it we got a lot to, to cover today uh, so real quickly who we are uh, I see some new faces here on the registration list and, and a lot of uh, a lot of old timers here that have been been coming to, to all of our webinars so uh, thanks thanks for everybody but we are an uh, extended enterprise research research and, and consulting organization and uh, what that means is that we focus on all the learning technology applications for non-employees uh, so anybody that's training their association members or maybe from a corporate standpoint their channel or their customers or students or anybody that's not taking mandatory training uh, from an, an employee LMS uh, standpoint is, is, our, is our focus and so what we do is uh, we research that we research the vendors we uh, talk to LMS buyers and users all around the world and uh, we share that knowledge uh, or basically collect and, and share it, uh, via our blog and, and these webinars and uh, we're completely uh, independent uh, research analysts so uh, we don't have any affiliations with, with any LMS providers so we we give it to you uh, as we find it, and you know, with our analysis on uh, what's happening in, inside the industry, we helped uh, or we have uh, reviewed now 100 LMSs, just crossed our 100 LMS mark uh, here in the last two years. Uh, I personally uh, have reviewed uh, every all 100 of these uh, LMSs, and that's from talking to their executives, from uh, talking to LMS vendors from an executive standpoint, uh, and then working with the. the people that are specialized in, in knowing the application to really get in deep and, and understand what it can do and 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 documenting all that uh, so that we can help LMS buyers uh, buy LMSs. So uh, that's who we are. Uh, today we're going to bring you some LMS expertise straight from the farm. Uh, and so uh, it looks like I cut off Mike here by accident. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry Mike. The uh, so about 15, maybe 12 years ago, uh, I met Mike at a Digital Now conference where we were competing vendors uh, all the way back then, uh, working inside the association space. As you know, Digital Now, or a lot of people on this call know, uh, is, is, a, is a great show to, to network and, and share advances in technology and member in, in engagement in, in the association space. And uh, as we were chatting one day, we, we found that we had something in common, and, and that's that we were both farm owners. And so uh, we, we both uh, left the, the racket of the city to uh, become LMS and e-learning experts practicing what we preach by doing it in a remote place. And uh, I have a Christmas tree farm in, in Pennsylvania, and Mike's got a real nice uh, piece of property up north. Uh, but I've got uh, 20 years in, uh, so we'll, we'll have a farm theme here. I got 20 years in, in LMS, 13 years I, I sold learning management systems. Uh, and, and now I, you know, I spend a lot of my time blogging and, and helping uh, LMS buyers uh, buy better. And you know, my philosophy from my dad all the way from uh, day one is everything's easy once you know how. And, and so that, that's what I'm trying to do here at, at Talented Learning. Uh, Mike, are you introduce yourself and WBT? Yeah, I'm Mike Brassa from WBT Systems. And I've been with WBT for you know 16 years now. And I've been in the, uh, the high tech um, and uh, both in hardware and software business for the last 35 years. So I've been around and I've seen quite a bit and with uh, with our system I've uh, worked with both um, enterprise corporate and and now specializing in the association uh, marketplace. So uh, um, we appreciate any questions you have and I, I hope we'll be able to handle those for you. So back to you John. And maybe oh, a little bit of your company quick. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you a little bit about WBT. Um, WBT at a glance, uh, WBT has been around for 20 years uh, in business. It's a very flexible learning platform. Top Class is our platform if you haven't heard of it before. We've got customer relationships that range back over 20 years. So, I mean, we've, we've got some really long-term customers in with the software. And back then, it was primarily corporate 
uh, type customers and also extended enterprise uh, customers. Our software is used in uh, 23 countries and it's been deployed in uh, 20 languages. As a matter of fact, Opera has come standard out of the box with five different languages. So uh, we, we like to think we've got most everybody covered, especially uh, in North America. The system's proven. Uh, it's, it's a pretty intuitive system and since it's been around for so long, we've really uh, focused it on certain areas. And primarily nowadays, um, we're really focusing heavily on the association uh, marketplace. And currently, we've got uh, over 5 million uh, users uh, are using Top Class every uh, every year, so I mean it's a uh, it's pretty broad ranging product, and we do cover. A, a, in one of the case studies, you'll see how we really do cover the globe. So thanks, John. Nice, thanks, thanks, Mike. And so uh, you know, as mentioned, I do a, a a lot of work in in researching the association space, continuing education, and and writing about it. But also, the, as it turns out, a, a large portion of my clients or our clients from a uh, an LMS buying standpoint or, or from the association space and, and what I found uh, here in the last two years is that there is a there's common challenges but the, the, the challenges have a different base in, in, in every organization we're, we're, we're going to get into that on why that is uh, but uh, association learning technology is not easy it's I think it's the the most difficult sector of uh, the associate or of the, the learning management space to, to focus on it We'll talk about uh, the different LMS focuses and, and, and how that prunes down or pairs down to uh, the associations and their challenges and then into the, the top 10 features of an association. And We took the approach today of not just saying that, you know, that it might not necessarily be the top features that all associations use because a learning management system is going to you know, launch e-learning and it's going to do a lot of same things regardless of what kind of learning management system it is, but what we focused on is, is really pulling out the 10 things today that association LMS vendors can do or do do that the rest of the LMS world doesn't do. And so really focusing it on, on that angle because these are the things that, uh, that you have to look for if you're shopping for an association LMS and use them as discriminators to qualify vendors in or out because this is where there's a lot of variation inside the marketplace. So we'll go through those top 10. We'll say why they are. We'll even talk about kind of a basic and an advanced adherence to those features uh, so we can kind of define them out for you. We've got, as Mike said, we got case studies uh, integrated uh, throughout uh, and, and also some, some polling. And, and so let me try to get this open and, and go to here. So how many associations, go ahead and uh, let me put the poll open. How many associations are are uh, in the United States. This is a trick question. Go ahead and uh, enter in your choice. 50,000, 90, what do you think, Mike? How, how many do we have? It changes every day. <laughs> uh, let's go, let's go uh, 50,000. 50,000. 50, yeah. Well, that's 500,000. Oh, 50,000 all the way up top there. Okay, 50,000. Well, we're looking to see uh, if people are in. The, you know, nobody's agreeing with you, Mike. You know, you're, oh. you're, on, you're on an island. <laughs> you're on an island. Somebody's asking a, a question. But somebody, uh, Michelle from the UK, sorry. Don't, we don't mean to be uh, uh, US-centric here in our, in our questions. As it turns out, it's really hard to define uh, the association space uh, because there is no global view of it. It's really country by country. And the only way you can uh, add it up is to literally go country by country. So, so far in our research, we focused on the U.S. resources that we're expanding out uh, here in the near future. So let me close this poll and share the results with you. And see, we're, we're over, um, uh, you know, we're uh, pretty much equal across uh, 9,500 and 1,000. And I think that uh, the, the tricky part about this GoTo really makes this hard, so I apologize for fumbling around here. I'm almost there. Uh, so uh, it really depends on how you define. Uh, as Mike said, it changes every day. But according to the IRS, there's over 90,000 of the uh, the 501 C6s, which are professional and trade organization. And we're going to focus our our presentation uh, on that group primarily today because they they have the most unique challenges. Uh, but the other, there's actually 1.3 million of charitable organizations, and, and really all of these, all 1.4 million or whatever the number is uh, uh, exactly today, have some degree of, uh, of education as, as part of their, their core mission. And uh, 
So, but we're going to focus on the professional trade organizations because there's associations for everything, as you know, and, and just by the nature of the uh, the attendees on, on uh, today's webinar, you know, we've we've got across a lot of these different verticals. It's it's even things uh, like there's a Pennsylvania. There's actually state by state, but without a doubt, there's a, a Pennsylvania. Uh, Christmas Tree Growers Association. I mean, there is literally for, for everything you can find like-minded professionals, but every one of these uh, professionals, uh, professional organizations have, you know, somewhat of the same challenges. And, you know, I, I'm preaching to the choir here, but education, information, you know, setting the standards, you know, doing the lobbying, uh, you know, inside of, of Congress for the, the particular topic, having lots of face-to-face -face and formal and informal gatherings to, you know, share information, support from, really from the time that you're, uh, even some organizations now going all the way back in, in, into elementary and middle school and, and providing educational opportunities uh, for free at, at that level so that from cradle to grave almost of, of embracing a, a, a professional throughout their their career. So it's very unique challenges and the, the technology or the, the, the challenges that are associated with that are 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 changing and, and they're very dynamic today and, and here's how they're changing the not so obvious way that they're changing is there's a competition for your members now that didn't exist before now granted there's always been alternate associations that professionals could join no matter what the industry is but there was always a limited number of those but it's changed now because with Facebook and LinkedIn you can uh, participate with uh, professional groups and people like-minded without paying. Uh, you don't have to pay, you know, 500 or 1500 or whatever it is a, a year to belong to these associations. And so there's, but then there's also the concept of, of education and training companies now are, and, and academic organizations are chasing the same members that, that associations have. And so they're providing free uh, massive open online courses uh, at the university level. Training companies are providing continuing education in every one of those verticals uh, that we looked at, those different industries. And all of those are, are taking a bite out of the, the power of associations or the, the compellingness. And so associations have to fight back. Uh, and fighting back with learning technology is a great way. But the other big answer is to, to fight back they need revenue, it's a, a, or you need revenue. It's a vicious cycle of, of trying to generate non-dues revenue to further your, your, your association. And, and a point I meant, meant to make uh, back before, that the main difference between an association and a, a corporation or a, a profit training company is that you don't take the profit out. You reinvest it back into the, the, the benefits of society or the benefits of that organization and so it's a it's a vicious circle to get enough revenue to create the content that is good enough to beat the private content so uh, you can generate non dues revenue and and repeat the circle and so it's those two challenges working in, in combination that are that that make the the whole process of technology and technology selection and application inside the association uh, so uh, so prohibitive so what's the technology uh, to bridge the gap? So, of course, association management systems, they've been around forever. And this is, if, if we had to name one point, this is the, the, big, the big thing that makes association LMSs different is that the association management systems have been in place for a long time uh, inside of virtually every organization or most organizations. And since they're all from different companies and they all have different functionality footprints, they're all deployed and configured differently, it makes it uh, so that LMSs have uh, the, the challenge of, of providing the learning functions of that, but pairing up with the association management system in a way that they work together in, in all the different diversity of that. And, and so uh, the two working in, in parallel is a no-brainer, a learning management system and an association management system, but how they work in parallel is is where all the challenge uh, occurs and and the last part of the the challenge or the technology is that associations because they couldn't find LMSs that worked appropriately for associations they were all corporate based for the longest time associations went down the path of growing their own custom systems to work with their AMS so it's a combination of 
of, of e-learning, non-standard, non-SCORM type e-learning that's, that's non-trackable and spreadsheets and custom systems and custom business processes all working in tandem with the, the association. And so all those things uh, uh, together are, are part of the challenge in, of, of finding uh, the, the, the needle in the haystack uh, of the association systems. Let me see, there's a question here. Let me get... Ah, okay, that person made the, the same thing, uh, the same uh, point there. Okay, so find an association system. So as I was mentioning, it's that ecosystem of custom processes and custom systems and the AMS solution. But then there's the further challenge of, of finding an association LMS. Is there's 600 different LMSs out there. And as I mentioned, I, I reviewed 100 of them. So granted, that's, I guess, not statistically significant when you uh, 100 out of 600. But out of the 100, what I found is about 20% have some focus on association. If that holds through, uh, as, and I fulfill the mission of, of meeting and evaluating all 600 of these LMS vendors, you know, that's a lot of different options out there for associations uh, to, to evaluate. And so uh, in terms of defining that specialization, uh, that, that's what the, today is, is, you know, what are these, uh, these, these exact features? And so it's helpful to take a step back. I believe it's helpful to take a step back and, and look at the, uh, the landscape of these 600 LMSs. There's, there's the employee LMSs. The employee LMSs are, you know, the longest lived ones. They've been around for 30 years. They focus on compliance. They're integrated with talent management systems. They're about managing employees, and, and they're about mandatory learning. Uh, it's your users can voluntarily use it, but typically it's funded and purchased and oriented towards uh, the mandatory uh, training aspects of an organization to to meet compliance. And then there's the extended enterprise, and a lot of people associate or <laughs> wrong word uh, uh, many people think associations are, are part of extended enterprise and in some degree they are because they they sell content but it's very different because extended enterprise is really focused towards corporate applications of channel and partner management and, and customer training and though it shares aspects it's very different than uh, than associations but then there's also the academic and for years, we thought inside the LMS industry that academic was, you either were in academic or you were in corporate. You know, there was no crossover on the systems. But I'm definitively convinced now that there is crossover uh, in the systems that uh, lots of academic features from MOOCs to, uh, to uh, being able to have longer tenured classes that have lots of media components that are authored by teachers and not administrators you know, inside the system. You know, those type of things have made it into uh, to other LMSs. And then there's associations that, that shares aspects with all of that. With employees, you know, you want to manage and launch training. With extended enterprise, you want to sell it. With academic, you want to sell that continuing education and, and sell it in a way that's, that's very similar to uh, university classes that they can get. And they have to, you know, manage, manage that continuing education. And so... It gets confusing for buyers uh, out there when they're looking for association LMSs because it looks like all the other type of LMSs could work for an association, and that, that's really part of the challenge. I don't know how to get around that challenge uh, other than uh, doing what you're doing now, which is, which, which is educating yourself. So what are the, the top ten features? Let, let's, let, let's get into them now. So uh, number one is, is cloud. Now, th that may seem obvious. Every uh, all of those 600 LMSs are in the cloud to, to some degree, or they're in uh, a hosted system. So that, that's not really what we mean. What we, what we mean, or what I find, and what Mike finds, is that a lot of associations are still in this on-premise mindset. A lot of the AMSs were on-premise. Uh, a lot of them were uh, installed long you know, before the evolution of the cloud. So there's a big mindset, I think, in, in hosting and, and keeping that data uh, local with your IT, and, and what I found is that you really have to break that to to be able to get the horsepower to to leverage the LMS across a global basis without investing so much money up front. Because cloud allows you to to get in at a lower price point, and it allows you to uh, predict your scalability without investing in that scalability all uh, up front. 
and that, that allows the whole initiative to, to get off the ground because what associations find is once they start generating the non-dues revenue or more non-dues revenue or more non-trade show revenue, it, it perpetuates itself by investing more and creating more content and furthering the global reach. And so, that, but there's two options uh, for, for the cloud that uh, we see out there. That one is the true cloud, which is that multi-tenant means everybody's on the same, all the clients of the LMS are on that same association uh, LMS, so the same version of that. And that provides some great horsepower for, organi for the LMS organizations to develop all their research and development uh, towards that, to have all their support focused on one version and not to support many versions. And so if you're an association and you're just tiptoeing into this or you're just trying to get into this, you want to try to find a true multi-tenant cloud because they're the, the cheapest options and they'll provide you the, the most flexibility while, while you're getting going. If you're an organization, however, that is has lots of those custom processes and business workflows and a longstanding uh, AMS and e-commerce front end, uh, those things... Uh, Necessitate, necessitate the need for a managed server environment in the cloud or in a host environment uh, that allows you to, to have a, an individual instance of the learning management system that can be integrated into your ecosystem uh, very closely and even customized, uh, but allows you to, uh, to really have a, a powerful system that goes beyond what the, the, the true cloud or the multi-tenant cloud uh, options are. Uh, so. Without a doubt, you want one of those two options uh, and use that as, as hey, a qualifier. Hey, John, if I could just add sure. one thing there on the cloud. Yeah, I, one of the things that I see is that I, I think uh, some of the IT departments in the larger associations still have a little bit of a problem. They prefer the, the premise base. And, I, and the big key there is privacy and security. There are some associations that do have you know, restrictive content that they don't want others to see or be able to copy or whatnot. And the other thing is... The, the ability for people to break into the system, you know, on the security side of things. So when you when you are considering, um, you know, cloud or no cloud, you know, when you look at, at the cloud, you definitely want to look at the larger players like the, you know, Amazon Web Services or the Microsoft Cloud or, or, or some of those, rather than some of the small ones, if you do have any concerns in either of those two areas. Great. That's good advice, Mike. Thanks. Thanks. And here's another one that, uh, boy, Mike knows this, this topic cold, so... There's, uh, there's many AMSs as there are LMSs, is, uh, is, is my theory. There, I was on Review My LMS uh, or AMS.com, and uh, Capterra has a whole section on it. And so probably just as challenging, uh, as you know, to find the, the right AMS. But just like an LMS, though, once you have that and you deploy it and you spend all the money to configure it and roll it out, and have all your members touch it and integrate that into your finance systems and your account and your order distribution and fulfillment, you don't get rid of it in a hurry. Uh, AMSs are, you know, they're very sticky. They're in that organization for a long time. And they kind of grow in, in, uh, un, uh, under their own, uh, under their, to the beat of their own drummer uh, in each organization depending on, on what you need. And so, Every LMS is going to tell you that they can integrate with an AMS, but can and have are really two different things. And so can integrate means that, hey, we have RESTful APIs or we have web services, and we can integrate. We can do single sign-on and share catalogs and things like that. The, the problem with can and have and the difference between have is that AMS integrations are much more complex than the typical corporate HRIS or ERP complications. They have a lot of different touch points, and that's because the AMS and the LMS share functionality. Uh, they have common functionality in, in a lot of cases, and organizations or associations need to make the, the, the choice of do they keep that functionality in the AMS or do they put that function out, or do they roll it out with the new LMS, or do they do it in both, and what's the workflow and shared data, and so some things, uh, some of those points of integration are single sign-on, so uh, the AMS is already member-facing, members have access to it, they already know how to get to it, it's just part of the process of, of signing up, so to be able to access the learning without logging in is critical. Organizational hierarchy that's 
you know, coming from member clients, like business to business clients and their clients, is all shared with the LMS, which can drive content assignments or content access or pricing. The catalog itself, so uh, you know, the AMS or the storefront, in a lot of cases, is selling books and publications and trade shows and dues, and all of that e-commerce and taxation is is worked out already in those systems. So to be able to to dovetail into that from an LMS standpoint versus ha having your own uh, e-commerce and to take the content from the LMS and display it in the, L the AMS and when the purchase happens to be able to access that content or continue an education out of the LMS are all touch points of, of sharing data back and forth. Uh, and, and then finally the reporting and the actual CE management. So you know how many credits did you get and what states are they good for and, and actually reporting to the accreditation bodies, you know, those things can happen in, in really both the systems. And so uh, the points of integration in each one of those seven or eight points right there is, is a mouthful. It, it's not something that you can just flip a switch in a, in a common LMS. So uh, the, you know, the second part of, uh, of today's uh, recommendation is that you really want to push vendors on specifics of their AMS integrations and which ones and specifically, you want to try to find if you have IMS or NetForum. You know, it's I, ideally you want to find that exact experience, not parallel experience, uh, is my advice. And so, Mike's got a lot of, uh, of, of expertise on this. Why don't you tell us what what you guys are up to with AMS? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. You, what you spoke of, the, the can and have, are really two different things. You can do anything if you've got enough money to throw at it. So. You know, we ended, you know, and we've understood that for years. And we spent the last couple of years putting together a uh, a plug and play situation for integration with AMS systems. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, 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 one of the most common ones is is IMS, and IMS used to, you know, require you had to get consultants involved on both sides and and do a lot of work and a lot of programming and whatnot to to get the things to talk and and they would I mean and but what we decided to do it needed to be a much more plug and play kind of a situation so we've got an API that we've developed um, that allows you to it's just configurable which touch points you want to have come over from the AMS uh, to the to the LMS and which components you want to have go from top class to whatever AMS that you have so for instance and we've done hundreds of of uh, of integrations over the years, and that's how we developed our expertise on being able to develop this this integration bridge that we have in standard in top class now. This particular one right here that's up on the screen, this case, this is a little bit of a case study here, um, and it's just to give you an idea of the importance of making sure that you really uh, flesh out what you want for your integration touch points with between an AMS and an LMS. This one here is a worldwide association representing the pharmaceutical industry. And they've got uh, uh, members and chapters in over 50 countries. So it was a little bit of a, of a technical challenge here, just, just languages on the conference calls that I'd be on with these people. But what they wanted to do was um, the creation and maintenance of users needed to be real time so that it would pass information back and forth between the AMS and the LMS so that once users were either created or updated or whatever in the AMS, that user could simply go and go right into the LMS without having to do anything else instantly. And so that was a, a key factor for them. Another one was the creation and maintenance of groups. And with groups, that's the group structure. It could be you have the national, the national organization, and then each state has a chapter, and they may have subchapters and all that. Well, all that information was being kept in their AMS, and they wanted that to also populate over to top class, so it would create the group structure in top class, which it does. But that one didn't need to be real time. That just needed to be a nightly, a nightly feed. And so they decided that one needed to be nightly. And then once again, the creation and maintenance of online products. Many um, associations that have AMSs, if their AMS has an e-commerce capability, they build the catalog in there where they have their course offerings and the pricing and all those kinds of things and information about their courses and whatnot. And so rather than have to recreate those in the LMS and then build the courses or import the courses into the LMS, they wanted that information to automatically be passed from the AMS to top class. And so what that happens there is that they've got a stored procedure that they run whenever they need to, whenever they need to update their, their catalog. So it, it handles all the creation and maintenance. This in the past took up a ton of time for the staff and now it's totally automated within the system. So it's a lot less error prone. This particular integrate, the implementation has been going since 2009. But just to give you an idea, the type of information that these people are 
are syncing up between the two systems. It isn't just for single sign-on, which a lot of people think integration, oh, it's single sign-on, that's all we need, but it really isn't. So if you look on the first column there, that's the key group information. That's the group information that passes from the AMS automatically to top class and sets up the structure. So for instance, they've got a code. Each group has a code in their IMS database and the title of the group, you know, uh, Massachusetts chapter, for instance. The group type, is it an affiliate chapter? Is it an affiliate? Is it a chapter? Is it a member group? Is it a non-member group? Um, so all those kinds of things can be filtered out that way. And then, of course, if there's an address to it, if it's a particular state address, uh, you know, state, country, um, or whatever um, address that's there for the uh, group information. Now, the second, the middle column, that shows the key user data that they sync up. For, and once again, it's pulling this all from the AMS and dragging it off into the LMS. For instance, first name, last name, email. Um, one of the things they want to do is they want to be able to have the systems automatically uh, talk to the member f directly from, so if they have email notifications and those kinds of things, they're going to come out of both systems. The type of member that it is. For instance, you can have uh, a member, uh, a lifetime member, for instance, a premium member, and all of those can have different pricing structures associated with them. So you want to be able to break those down. So you want to have member type, member status, um, active member, non-active member. What their, what their status is, um, any kind of information, contact information, they wanted all of that information pulled from the AMS into, uh, into top class. And then once again, in their case, um, if the user went in and updated any member information, if they were allowed to, they wanted that to be passed back to the AMS automatically, once again, to reduce errors and whatnot when it's done automatically as opposed to making a phone call. And then, of course, in their online thing, uh, for their courses, their course catalog, their events, their conferences and those kinds of things. They wanted all of that information to come directly out of the AMS where it was originally built and just populate the top class database. And you can see their code, category, status, type. So these are all the different types of touch points that you can have in an AMS that you want to have brought down to an LMS. And there's others. This just happens to be one particular instance that we have here. And it's very important that, that you take into account exactly what it is that you want to have go back and forth. And in our case, with the automatic, with the integration bridge that we have, it's just a matter of defining what these are and then just configuring the, the pipe and it's done. And so rather than it taking days or weeks or months to do it, it's, it's done in less than a day. Wow, wow. Now I remember in a former life to, to do something like this from a, even a customized basis, uh, we did it once with uh, uh, Personify for an organization, ran about $75,000 to, to build this exact thing. So. And it took probably about six months of, of effort. So yeah. to take that down to a connector is, is, is kind of neat to see how the industry's uh, progressing along there. So We do test it for a day afterwards, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Mike mentioned uh, that, that's really interesting. Uh, and it falls right into you know what we're going to talk about next, uh, audience segmentation. kind of goes by a lot of names, by domains or uh, dynamic grouping uh, or audience segmentation. Uh, or synonymous names or semi-synonymous names inside the industry for this capability. But Mike hit it right on the head when he was talking about chapters and sub-chapters. You know, that's the, the structure and, and the, the trend of uh, associations uh, over the last decade here in, in the U.S., but then also uh, around the world. I've, I've recognized this uh, trend in, in speaking to, to people in, in Australia and New Zealand and also in the U.K. It seems like uh, associations are consolidating, you know, and they continue that process of they're actually being less and, and then they get bigger versus, uh, you know, more and, and diverse. Uh, and so what that creates then is a real challenge to, to manage the, the good of the whole, but also the diversity of, uh, of the parts, of the regional parts. And to, to make uh, matters even a little more complicated, because they're not your employee, it's not like a, you know, a Yum Brands retail chain where they're you know still franchisers or, or or people that you can tell or chapters you can tell what to do. A lot of times they're semi-autonomous, and so they they have their own board of directors and and governance and and even though they are part of the larger organization, that they, they still have a lot of local diversity. So what that creates is is a challenge from an LMS standpoint to be able to support the umbrella organization but provide enough flexibility and tools for the, the individual chapters uh, and, and regional branches or regional affiliations uh, to, uh, to have the flexibility. And some feature sets that are part of this is you know, moving in and out of groups based on all those fields uh, that are coming over that, that Mike was describing. You know, those things 
you know, drive workflow in the LMS and, and put you in to different groups which have different views and different languages and different content and different instructors. Uh, the ability to have local affiliations, you know, upload their own content or localized content uh, that the, the mother affiliation is putting down single sign-on that's not at the master level but at each one of these uh, association or uh, chapter levels uh, and then the, the ability to, to delegate that administration so to, to paint white lines on the road so to speak for uh, the, the, the chapter or the, the sub-chapter organization so that they have capabilities maybe not all the capabilities but you give them a tool that's useful so they don't go out and buy their own rogue LMS uh, which is, is the, the first tendency of, of organizations is just to go by their own and because the minute that happens and you lose the reporting and the sharing of data and uh, you know, it, it's a challenge of working with, with multiple learning management systems. So uh, a good association LMS specializes in, in a lot of configurability around audience segmentation and to support different business rules at all the different levels simultaneously. If you can't do that, or if you have an organization that's structured that way, you know, this is one of the most critical things uh, to look for because it's, it's something that's not obvious up front uh, but can really make your whole implementation fail uh, down the road. All right, let's get to another poll. How many, so, sorry Michelle, uh, <laughs> over in the UK, got another US one here, but how many uh, US adults take continuing education uh, annually? Let me launch this poll. So I did a real nice series. Uh, of course, I'm biased uh, here on uh, continuing education. i have really digging deep into it. Even though I, I worked inside associations for almost 13 years you know, from an LMS uh, standpoint, uh, I was surprised as I started digging into the specifics of, of each one of these industries and, and, and of how much. And what was surprising to me is that, uh, so it looks like 85% say uh, uh, 90, uh, 96,000. And you know what, that, that is, that's probably, that's probably correct. You see, we, we've got a lot of people thinking uh, uh, a lot of adults consume. I think we have uh, 350 plus or minus uh, people in, inside the, uh, the United States uh, in general, uh, but what it, the latest census report said 46 million uh, was the answer, had a professional certificate or license and were participating in some form of continuing education. Continuing education being defined as, you know, anything past your formal education. So anything that you're obviously doing throughout your career that's uh, past actually earning your credentials. So it's maintaining your credentials or, you know, doing 24 hours or, 36 hours of continuing medical or continuing legal education uh, in, a, in a given year. If you add up all the people that are buying content and creating content, it's a $47 billion uh, marketplace according to the, the, the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau. And, and so that's 25% of the United States population. Uh, another interesting statistic from that report, I, I gleaned this ad, 90% is still instructor-led. So there's a huge opportunity for associations and this, there's a the not so obvious challenge competition from universities and training companies are going to drive this 90-10 to a, a much more, uh, I think, equitable uh, online versus ILT standpoint uh, in the future. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to move to more electronic and more technology to extend reach uh, inside the association space. And if you just guess that each one of these professionals has to take 10 hours a year, which I think is light, that's a half a billion, 500 million hours of continuing education uh, content that's consumed every year. And, and so the only way to manage that is, is through an LMS. Uh, the complexities of, of, this, uh, of this continuing education. Josh Burson, uh, on a side note, estimated uh, that our, the LMS marketplace is a $2.4 billion marketplace. I've seen other estimates as much as uh, $10 billion. Uh, that, that the LMS market is going to grow to. And so I think personally there's a lot of opportunity here with $47 billion in U.S. spending alone on continuing education and only $2.4 billion uh, going to uh, the LMS market that uh, specialist association vendors are, are really the ones that are taking and, and investing in, inside of uh, that industry and creating complex CE management. And CE management is, is, is uh, 
goes by a lot of different names depending on what industry it could be CME or CLE or CPE or if you're the UK CPD uh, CE credits in general so they go by a ton of different acronyms depending on what the name is but most LMSs say they can manage it but what they do is they they manage just the very basics and that is you know one that they give you credits for taking this particular course and that's easy you take this course you get these three credits but where and then you can download your certificate and a lot of employee LMSs have that capability but complex certification or complex CE management is what associations are now tasked with that if they're providing content they could be brought the same course might be providing continuing medical education continuing nursing education and CE credits for you know, some sort of practitioner that's not a, a doctor or a nurse and so it has to manage the complexities of that but even to take it even more complex each state has their own requirements so if you're a an attorney or a lawyer that's licensed in you know California and Nevada there's requirements for each one of those that are different on how much continuing education what type of continuing education uh, you can take it and, and what it's worth and uh, the LMS and, and, and good learning management systems, association learning management systems, have invested in building out the complexity to support that. And you won't find that. Nobody else has this requirement. Uh, so you don't find that in corporate LMSs. You don't find that. Uh, you're starting to find it a little bit in, in academic LMSs as they're also uh, trying to, to manage this. But it is a big differentiator uh, inside the industry. Uh, any thoughts on that, Mike? You see in a lot of the complex it, management? It, yeah, it really is. Uh, one of the things um, that happens a lot, and you, you kind of stated it, a particular course can be out there, uh, a, nas you know, a course given by a national association, that could have ramifications for several different accreditation types. And so one of the keys there is being able to say, okay, this course might be worth two credit hours for a CME, but for a CE, it might be worth three credit hours. And so you need to be able to take advantage of being able to manage um, those those complex CE requirements, and, and that's becoming something that's more common now with uh, with several with several associations I've been, uh, you know, in touch with. Especially in the last couple of months, it seems to be coming up more and more now. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. It's one of the the first things that I do when I'm when I'm helping LMS buyers buy or association buyers buy is, uh, you know, a lot of times they come with, you know, what about this LMS or this LMS, and one of the first questions I start pruning down into is is the CE management because if you fall down here uh, it, it doesn't matter about anything else because uh, it, it, is, it is really important. So okay. it's, it's definitely a value it's definitely a value add for the association that can manage those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and to compete you know to get back against competing against the LinkedIn and the Facebook and the free things you know they, they don't manage any of that so you know this is a, a big value add to provide members uh, you know if you can help manage the, the nightmare of, of tracking their continuing education and helping them uh, you know, report that to accreditation bodies. The other big thing that's different, so it, in a lot of LMSs you see a lot of uh, individual commerce uh, type of things, so add to cart and shopping carts and you know integration with a payment gateway and uh, you know even things like time to access to content so that you can you know, sell a bundle of courses for a certain amount of time. And you see a lot of standard features I see out there are, you know, being able to offer discounts or promotions or even organizational pricing uh, so that, you know, organization X gets it for this, organization Y gets it for that. So that seems to be pretty common in a lot of LMS systems. Even LMS systems that are focused on employees uh, are, are now either integrating with like Shopify or or rolling out this type of capability to sell some premium content, uh, and so it seems like every LMS has uh, this this capability. But where the differentiation occurs is in the organizational B two B commerce, and this is this stuff is challenging. It's not easy functionality, but this is, recognizes the fact that an association a lot of times has two types of members. They've got business members or organizational members and they also have individual members. So if you're an association of insert insurance agents, for example, you could have the individual agents, you know, pay a membership fee or you could go to Nationwide and Prudential 
and have them as your client and have all of their agents you know, become a member of, of your association. And when you do it that way, you have to sell on mass. You have to integrate with, you know, it might be 1,000 or 1,500 or 20,000 uh, different members that are a part of that business. And so you have to have commerce inside and outside the LMS to purchase content or bundles of content, assign that to users, uh, upload users in a bulk way, single sign-on, uh, manage the, the global and, and tax ramifications that are on, on, a, on a country or jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. All those things are challenges that you encounter when you're selling to organizations uh, versus individuals. And traditional LMSs and almost all LMSs uh, fall down in this capability. But it is something that just about every uh, association that I work with uh, has this, this requirement and, and challenge to, to sell or support the sale of, of content uh, to organizations. So that's the number five feature. We'll talk about, about a little bit about that. Uh, Ahab. Yeah. Um, by the way, Michelle, I just want you to know if you're still on the line that uh, the UK has more associations, I think, involved than almost the rest of Europe. So you're doing well there. <laughs> um, Ahip is a is a is a case study that I wanted to give you a, a kind of an example of of where they were and what they did and and where they are now, kind of a thing. Um, it is America's Health Insurance Plans. It's a very large trade association. Uh, they represent over 1,300 different health insurance plans. So uh, they have approximately 1,400 trade association members. And like John said, those some of them are companies like State Farm and Nationwide and, and those kinds of things. So with those 1,400 trade association members, they have over 45,000. Actually, this number has grown quite a bit since, since I did this. Uh, 45,000 users that actually partake of the LMS. Now, part of their background for AHIP, when I first started with them, almost all of their courses were book-based courses. So they were they were pretty much, you know, somebody would call in, order a book, take the uh, read the read the materials, and then they would go back to AHIP and take an online test that was offered by a third party. It wasn't even offered by AHIP; they just kind of managed it. So they had a really big problem there with a cumbersome fulfillment process, where you know people would call in, somebody. Had, at AHIP would have to take the call, take the order, and then it would go through a, an ordering process with a warehouse and everything else. So the, it was very prone to uh, errors. And it just it, this is the nature of the beast once you take the automation out of it. And what they found was, was that uh, when they came to us, members were losing interest in the whole education process. And they were having a really downward trend in, uh, in revenues, in sales, um, and in interest in their learning programs. So what they did is internally they got together to, to put a team together and they decided they wanted to move to an online model, mainly because it would be more, more in time, they could update things quicker uh, and get things out to, uh, to members in, in, a much, in a much easier fashion. They wanted to enhance the member experience, which, which that normally would do. And then once again, they really had to automate the order process. It was killing them staff-wise and everything else. They were spending most all their time on doing uh, managing the order process, and then uh, down below that, uh, managing the training history and certification piece uh, with the with the members. So you have to understand that any time a member passed a test, and 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 they had to send out a certificate to that member, sometimes it would get forgotten. The member would call, and and it would just be a whole a, a whole lot of of extra work that needed to be done uh, by their people. And so another goal that they said that the team set was they needed to reduce errors through integration with other applications. So that was kind of what the background was and what the, what the, uh, uh, what the team decided that they needed to do. So then what they did is with, our, with Top Class, with our LMS, they decided they want to take, they make all of their book courses online offerings. So we recommended a couple of places where they could actually, a couple of content shops where they could go in and do that. And at the same time, they wanted to be able to create their own courses um, on the fly using, using the LMS and the inbuilt authoring tools and whatnot and other authoring tools that are out there in the marketplace. So now they were able to start building their own SCORM-based courses that they could actually offer. Then the other thing that they decided to do is they wanted to bundle courses and training programs together. That way they could take a bundled program and turn it into a certification or designation program that they didn't have before. And once again, it was to try to drive uh, more value to the members. Now they're having certification, complete certification programs rather than piecemealing it. 
Now, a, a, a crucial piece on this was being able to offer multiple pricing structures. You know, they, they had some trade association customers that had, you know, that would have 5,000 agents that would be enrolling in programs and others that only had a few hundred. So they wanted to offer their larger customers better pricing for the training. So with this, they set up multiple pricing structures within the system. And they needed to automate the certification process. So they did that with TopClass. They were able to automate the certification process. So now learners could actually go in. And not only that, but education coordinators in those, those corporate uh, companies could actually go in, print out training histories, print out certificates, so it became much more self-service. So it took all that, all that effort away from that association. And one of the really nice features that they had was that the member companies have dashboards. So their education training coordinators can go in and see where their employees stand in their training, where they are in their current training, what they've done, what they need to do, and all those things. And a thing that, that AHIP wanted to do was they wanted to have a progress indicator so the member company could actually see how much money they had left in their debit accounts. So for instance, a like a like a, a major insurance company say, I'll give you we'll we'll give you ten thousand dollars put on account so that when employees come in, they can just enroll in the training and just have that degrade as, as, they use, as they use it up. And then so that these education coordinators could actually see what was left in their accounts and know whether or not they needed to recharge them again. So it kind of became almost an automated sales process for AHIP as well. And then the other thing that, that they decided they wanted to do was cross-selling. So if an employee was buying one training course, the system would automatically recommend another training course, thus increasing their revenues. Same thing, everything was, became self-service for purchases, for printing of training history and certificates, and they had needed to have a full integration with their AMS, their financial systems, which I think was Epicor, I think their AMS is IMS, and then Fulfillment Center. So even, they were still selling books and things, but they needed the LMS to tie into the Fulfillment Center so the order process would be automatic. So what happened was, was that as results go, it really enhanced the education and training offerings to the members. Now they had bundled offerings, they had certification offerings along with the continuing education credits, and they also were able to print off their training, their training history and transcripts and certificates. So it became better customer service. The call volume for problems and those kinds of things was instantly reduced within the first month by 20%, right off the top. So, and it just kept going down on that. So they really were able to improve their operations. They increased their member participation in training. Their training programs almost immediately started climbing, and with that, their revenue started climbing. And today, it's a very successful program, and, and it's a major, major portion uh, of, of what they provide um, their members. And, and needless to say, it's really, really helped get them uh, much better uh, non-dues revenue generation stream uh, within that organization. Wow, that's a whole bunch of speak you don't hear from a corporate LMS uh, right there. That is, uh, but that is the, the business challenge and that probably a lot of our attendees are, are facing right now as, as they go through the transition of, of how business was done for 50, 60, 70 years to you know, now it, it competing in a competitive marketplace. So uh, great story. Especially with, the younger, especially with the younger audience. They don't want to have to go to the books. They want to do it online. Yeah, sure, sure. No doubt. All right. Well, I have never created a webinar nor given one uh, where we get done early uh, or <laughs> don't run out of time is a better way to say it. Uh, so we've, we've got uh, just a few minutes left here to, to, to cover some of these bigger ones. Uh, but a real good discussion uh, today, I think, of what you folks are doing and what organizations are, are really doing uh, inside the association space. So the, the next big thing that you need in any LMS, association or not, is analytics. Uh, is, is the ability to, to measure, uh, you know, how you're doing. Uh, you know, from an employee LMS standpoint, it's like, you know, have they or have they taken this training? And that's kind of what all LMSs have, you know, that LMS completion or progress uh, uh, type of reports. But a, an association LMS needs some advanced analytics. They, they need the ability to, to really do ad hoc reporting, you know, look at a whole lot of different things. You saw all those different AMS fields that uh, were coming over uh, in that case study. You know, to be able to sort and, and create reports based on those fields and the, the interoperability of, the, of, of those fields working together in terms of sorting and, and grouping uh, provides you know, flexibility to really get insights into your organization. But there's also the whole idea of, of being like an e-commerce site where you have to track 
you know, where people are coming from, what devices and what browsers they're using as you're growing globally because all that impacts the type of content and uh, the type of users that you have and how you can engage them and engage them better uh, than the competition. So Google Analytics type reports and then also a healthy dose of, of e-commerce in general of, of, you know, abandoned shopping carts and conversions and, you know, all those things that you'll see on a Shopify or Volusion or any other magenta e-commerce type uh, site uh, integrated right into the LMS. It, it needs to be as modern as it, whether you're selling Amazon books or you're selling content, uh, the, the analytical uh, capabilities. Uh, the next feature is CRM, and this is one that probably nobody on, on the call would, would expect because, you know, what's a CRM? I think it goes by a lot of, it's a customer relationship management software, and there's a lot of different flavors of it from very simple ones like you know, MailChimp to, you know, very powerful ones that are more marketing automation systems uh, like Marketo, uh, perhaps. But at its simplest, what a CRM does is it, it keeps track of, of notifications and emails that are sent and really how organizations or how individuals are interacting with them. And it gives you a, a tremendous insight into uh, into your marketing efforts and the effectiveness of your marketing efforts. Now, LMSs in general have uh, had basic you know, send text or uh, email notifications, automatic notifications for decades. So it, it's not a new capability. The new capability is is the ability to use all those fields Mike was talking about to create those dynamic groups or segmented audiences that we were talking about and firing off specific emails to them, you know, based on content they've consumed or where they're licensed or how they've interacted with the association in the past or uh, you know, all those different features to be able to create targeted groups and promotions at them and then measuring how well it works. You know, did they open it up? Did they click? What did they click? Where did they come into the site? Did they purchase? What was their conversion rate? That's what a CRM will do for you. The, uh, a lot of LMSs integrate uh, with those uh, out of the box or as, as a professional services, but also a lot of association uh, LMSs actually build that capability into their system now. Uh, to provide that level of marketing insight that you just don't need in, inside a corporate uh, LMS. Uh, without a doubt here, this is this could have probably been number one because uh, this is where it all starts, but uh, associations, you know, have trade shows, have events, seminars, you know, they crowdsource that content, you know, lots of members create the content for that uh, and present at the shows. It's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge and experience you know, that, that occurs in that, and it's important to capture that and to record it and to have it available uh, through time. So that, that could be recording, you know, virtual presentations like today or anything live, the tools to capture the video, to convert them into the, uh, the LMS, to, and then do all the other things, to sell, to target content, to put it as continuing education, assign credit. Um, but the, the easiest place to get content is where you already have content. And so if you are an association that's, you know, entering into uh, e-learning or online learning in general, uh, this is the easy place to go, the low-hanging fruit to start populating, you know, with some content as you start to sell and, and then grow the, uh, the, the operation. Uh, the other one here is, is uh, without a doubt, mobile. So voluntary users are your members. Uh, they're not mandatory. They're not your employees. You don't know whether they're on a Dell laptop or an Apple. You don't know if they're uh, logging in on a tablet at their kid's soccer game or late at night. Uh, on, they're coming in off their phones, their mobile devices, their every conceivable platform. And so you need, associations need to account for that. They need to account from a content design standpoint, but then also a delivery and an LMS delivery standpoint. Uh, to recognize the fact that they are going to come off of everything and you can't test everything. Uh, so you need a, an LMS that is able to work on any device. There's really two main strategies. There's responsive design, which we'll show you in just a second, Mike will show you, and then there's uh, the app-based. Responsive design means you don't need to download anything. The LMS just works or the site just works on whatever device, it's sized properly, it's shifting menus around, it's reorienting the screen, it's making it so that you can use it without scrolling, pinching, squinting. Uh, apps, on the other hand, are things that you have to download from the Apple or the Android store. You have to install them on, on onto, your, uh, onto your device and you have to keep them updated. 
And all those things uh, are, are certainly nice, but there are extra steps or challenges that if they're not providing any more capability than the core LMS, uh, they're really wasted uh, type features. So what we see is, is organizations uh, really go into this uh, uh, different uh, responsive design. And all the new LMSs uh, are, are always like this now. You know, any, any of the new ones that, that are born in the last couple of years are all responsive design. Uh, they, uh, they're not worried about app strategies, they're just making it available for everyone. So here's a, a good example of uh, how the same LMS, the exact same thing displays differently on, on three different devices. And so just reorganize it. It's hard to do this, and it's not something that you can just go retro on your product and say, you know, now I want to make it responsive. You can, but it's expensive, and it tears down all the way to the foundation of the core. And so it's a big differentiation. A lot of vendors will take that app approach. Not because they think the app approach is better, though they will tell you that, but because to retro responsive fit your, your, your LMS is, is a tough thing to do. Uh, the, the global aspect in both employee and association LMSs is, is something to share. So all the things that we've talked about today, but to roll in the ability to have language localizations, to be able to have the interface and manage the content in various languages, uh, those language localizations so that it's smart enough to display the right languages to the right users based on their profile and give them content uh, based on the languages that they can and want to consume. All that is real challenging to do inside a learning management system, uh, inside of any system to, to support 10 or 15 or 20 different languages simultaneously and manage that and report on that in, in, a, in a viable way uh, is is all requirements from an association standpoint and, and something LMSs uh, can do it. It even rolls down into the catalog and even administrative features and so you can really get deep into you know how global or not global uh, your LMS if you are a global organization with chapters and, and uh, you know alliances around the world that really narrows down you know the type of LMSs uh, you know that, that are applicable for you that as, as viable solutions association global LMS is a, a, pretty, a pretty small category of, of capable companies. Social learning, uh, as we, uh, uh, associations are exactly this, you know, we're bringing like-minded individuals together and so to have social learning, the ability to like, to share, to have news feeds, to post content, to administrators to curate content, uh, but that whole ability to get the, the crowdsourcing power of your, of, of your like-minded individuals actually helping you know, move the association forward from a knowledge standpoint, sharing content, experiences, rating content, you know, sharing that on, uh, on the formal social media networks uh, is all part of the social learning. Logging in with your social account uh, is, is a big feature set inside associations. And even though we said top 10, we just couldn't uh, resist here putting the 11th one in. And that's really about the consumer interface. And that, we covered a lot of that from an e-commerce standpoint. but it, it's got to look and feel like Best Buy and Amazon and Facebook and Google kind of all wrapped up into one and not all LMSy uh, with tables and tables and tables of data, uh, which is what you know a lot of LMSs look like. It, it, the less it looks like an LMS, the, the better it's going to work uh, for your uh, members in, a, in an engagement uh, standpoint. And so that really is uh, the uh, the bear captured here on, on our game cam here in Pennsylvania. So uh, we see that fella comes through our farm about once a year and destroys all our, our bear feeders. But as he's walking away, so are we a couple minutes late. Uh, but the, the conclusion and the takeaway today is, is that association LMSs are, are special. It's not the same feature set, even though they share some features. To make it even more complicated, the existing AMS and, and custom-built uh, workflows inside of associations mandate that the LMS be incredibly flexible and configurable to to adjust to existing processes uh, or otherwise it mandates a complete rip and replace which you know, associations aren't prepared or fiscally prepared to do. Uh, finding that uh, vendors that uh, that can and have d done uh, AMS integration and can speak about it, it you know, is critical to, to finding the right partner for you and it's critical as, as Mike was saying to really define those requirements. Define what your AMS does and what you want your LMS to do and what the touch points are going to be 
and try to do as much of that up front before you start engaging vendors uh, so that you can use that as a template to, to qualify uh, people in and out. And no LMS is right for everyone, but every LMS is, is right for someone. And as, as an LMS buyer, it's your responsibility to, to figure that out through some, some diligence and, and hard work up front. So uh, there's our presentation for today. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you very much for joining me today and helping prepare this and sharing oh, your welcome. insight. Uh, it, it's been interesting to, to hear the sophistication of what you guys are doing over there. And so uh, appreciate it very much. And, and the, the audience here for attending and sticking with us here for 65 minutes is, is uh, above and beyond the call of duty. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. And we'll, we'll follow up with a, an email here and a recording of the session if you want to share it with any of your colleagues. And we look forward to you uh, joining uh, some upcoming webinars. We've got one coming up in a couple weeks on really digging down deep into LMS e-commerce. And then on uh, November 13th, we're having our first annual Talented Learning uh, Vendor Awards. So if you've been following the blog at all, you see we've been breaking the LMS uh, marketplace up into different types of LMSs, uh, just like today with associations, and, and then saying who the best is. And so the best of the best will be named uh, here in, in the different categories, and we hope to see you on any of all our upcoming webinars. So uh, have a great day, everyone, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Uh, thank you.